We are going to be looking at the Christmas story today through two passages of Scripture. The first passage of Scripture I, I suspect you probably are very familiar with. You probably read it uh, every year. But the second passage of Scripture, which is where we're going to spend the bulk of our conversation today, is probably less familiar to, to many of us. But uh, it's where we're going to focus today. Now, with a show of hands, uh, how many of you like to receive Christmas gifts? Everybody? Yeah, should have your hands raised. That's good because the title of my message today is God's five Christmas gifts for you. God's five Christmas gifts for you. And so if you have a Bible, let's see what those five Christmas gifts are. We're going to start our reading today in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. And so if you have it, a Bible, whether it's in paper form like this or in digital form on your phone or one of your other app, uh, digital devices, turn to Luke chapter 2, uh, skip down to verse 4, which is where we're going to begin our reading today. And then as always, try to picture the scene in your mind. Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 4. Joseph was a descendant of King David. He had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in the manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. Now skip down to verse 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. This past Tuesday, I received a text message from my brother Monty, who lives in Seattle area, informing me that his daughter, my niece, was on her way to the hospital. My niece was pregnant and she had gone into labor. You know, for the past nine months, Sorel has been nurturing a, a little baby in her womb. Uh, for nine months, she and her husband, Udenze, have been waiting for the arrival of this child. And on Wednesday morning, 12 hours after my brother's initial announcement, Sorel birthed into this world a healthy baby girl, her name, Chanaza Noel. Their nine months of waiting was over. Waiting. Is waiting easy for you or hard? You know, would you describe yourself as a patient person or an impatient person? You know, when we read this Christmas story involving the birth of of Jesus, it's easy for us to miss the fact that the birth of Jesus and the people of Israel had been really waiting for the birth of Jesus for centuries. Unlike the nine month waiting time of my niece for her baby to be born, the people of the Bible had been waiting for over 700 years for Jesus to be introduced into the world. Show of hands, how many of you would agree with me when I say that 700 years is a long time to wait? Yeah. 
Did you know that 700 years prior to the angel's night sky proclamation lived a man who had announced Jesus' birth? His name was Isaiah. The Bible tells us that he was married. He was the father of two sons. And he was widely known among his neighbors as a man of God. As a trustworthy, what we would call an Old Testament Hebrew prophet. If you were to read the the book of Isaiah, a book that bears his name in the Bible, one of the things that you would learn about this man Isaiah is the fact that he had a soft spot in his heart for the poor and downtrodden. And so consequently, uh, God would often entrust to Isaiah messages that God wanted him to deliver to the people of Judah, the, the area that he was living in, really to give them hope. And oftentimes when you read his, his, this, this, this sort of this autobiography of his life, you will see how God gave Isaiah these messages to speak out against the social injustices that the government of the time did, which only made him unpopular, if you will, among the kind of the royal court. In fact, tradition suggests that Isaiah was martyred for his preaching by the king. Uh, you know how he was, he was killed? He was cut in two, cut in half. Not, a, not an easy way to live. Now you say, Pastor Mike, you're starting to depress me. What's all this got to do with Christmas? Good question. Early in Isaiah's preaching ministry, God entrusted Isaiah with this message that likely put him in hot water. Because Isaiah preached this message that God was going to send to the people a newborn king who would be unlike any other king that the people had ever known. This king, Isaiah promised, would love them. This king, Isaiah promised, would be a champion for them. And with Jesus' birth... God promised through Isaiah that there would be five gifts that would be offered to everyone who received this child. Do you know what those five gifts are? Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This is what we're told. This is what Isaiah preached to the people of Judah. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He goes on. He says the government and its peace, his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. You hear the parallel between that and what happened with the angels' announcements to the shepherds? You know, brothers and sisters, with the birth of Jesus, you and I can be benefactors, according to Isaiah, of five gifts. Do you know what they are? Let me give them to you. I'll write them down on your app notes, and then we'll unpack them one by one. Gift number one. The first thing that Isaiah promises to those of us who put our faith in Jesus, who go to baby Jesus, if you will, is the gift of security. Security. We're told here that security, the government will rest securely on his shoulders. Gift number two, we're promised, is the gift of guidance. Guidance. Gift number three, power. Power. Gift number four, am I going too fast? An eternal home. An eternal home. And gift number five, we're told here, is the gift of peace. The gift of peace. So let's unpack each one of these, beginning with gift number one, the gift of security. God promises that in Jesus, the government will rest on his shoulders. That's what Isaiah said. 700 years, the people have been waiting for Jesus to come when the government would rest securely on his shoulders. What does that mean? Well, basically, translation, it means that Jesus is in control. Jesus is large and in charge. 
Isaiah wanted his neighbors to know, God wants you and me to know that Jesus in God's kingdom is the tip of the spear. He is the head who rules over everything. The government rests on his shoulders. So the trans, I guess the transferable concept for you and for me is this, brothers and sisters, that upon Jesus you and I can lay our burdens. You know, my dad used to say, and I, you've heard me share this with you before, that children should chase butterflies, and it's up to us as adults to do the heavy lifting. Children should chase butterflies. They shouldn't have to worry about, how am I going to pay for stuff? That's, the kids all should say amen to that, you know. It's up to us as adults to do the heavy lifting. You know, brothers and sisters, you know that that's, who's really good at heavy lifting? According to the Bible, it's Jesus. He wants us to, to, to lean on him. I think one of the reasons why the shepherds ran to, the, to, the, the, to Bethlehem that day is because for 700 years they had been waiting for this king who they could lay their burdens on. You know, if anybody knew what it was like to be misrepresented or misunderstood, it would have been the shepherds. They were outfits. They were kind of social outcasts. And they were looking for an advocate, someone who they could lay their burdens on. And I wonder if, if any of us here today or maybe tuning in online are carrying any kind of heavy burdens. Maybe some of you are weighed down today as you walk into this place or you tune in online with a worry. Maybe you have a concern for a family member or a friend. You know, if the prophet Isaiah were here today, he would, he would say to you and to me, he would say, don't worry, brothers and sisters. Jesus is in control. All the worlds can rest their burdens upon him because it, the government rests securely on his shoulders. And so he invites you and me to lay our burdens onto him. So let's do that right now. Would you just put your palms open again, a posture of receptivity, maybe close your eyes if it helps you concentrate in, in some way, and just take a deep breath in and, and hold it, then deep exhale out. And then just pray this in your heart. Say, Jesus, I want you to be my security. And I'm holding on to Isaiah's promise, Jesus, that you are in control of everything. And so right now, in this moment, I'm going to lay before you this concern, and you lay it before him. It could be a financial concern. It could be a health concern. It could be a, a relational concern. Maybe you have a spiritual concern, either for yourself or somebody who you love. Jesus, now, right now, because you hold everything securely in your, on your shoulders, I'm laying before you this concern and you fill in the blank. Good. Gift number two. A second gift that God promises you and me here through the words of Isaiah is the gift of guidance. The gift of guidance. Guidance is a Christmas gift, brothers and sisters, that God wants you and me to receive. Jesus, or Isaiah preached that Jesus would be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, show of hands, how many of you have ever utilized the help of a counselor? Right? Maybe you've gone to somebody for some legal counsel, right? Any of you ever gone to the doctor or dentist? Hopefully, all of us, we're seeking out medical counsel. Are you with me? Maybe some of you have even sought out relational counseling. Now, here's a question to think about. How do you distinguish between good counseling and bad counseling? Do you know? What does it take to be a wonderful counselor as Jesus is described here by Isaiah? You know, I've learned in my life, and I suspect that many of you have too, is that a good counselor will help organize the clutter. A good counselor will help facilitate sort of clarity, and they will indirectly guide. Because oftentimes, a good counselor can see things that, that we will miss, right? We all have blind spots. But in my opinion, do you know what separates a good counselor? from a great counselor, a wonderful counselor? 
A great counselor listens well. But more than that, a great counselor has mastered what I call the art of silence. Do you know what I mean by that? Let me explain. Oftentimes, when a counselor and a client are having a conversation, the counselor will ask a question, and the client then will subsequently answer that question. But when the conversation is discussing things that are involve maybe a traumatic experience in this person's life, and when a counselor asks the question, maybe kind of penetrates a little bit into the, into the mire and the muck and, and, and maybe even into the pain, it's not uncommon for the person who's going to answer that question to begin to relive that experience over in their mind. To start thinking about the dynamics of what maybe took place. And when that person begins to think about maybe and relive that experience over in their mind, their outward response is silence. 30 seconds. One minute. Two minutes. Four minutes. And the temptation as a counselor is to kind of, it, it's awkward, it's, it's the, the, the silence is deafening and the temptation is to try to fill up that empty space with maybe words or, or a response or perhaps another question. That's what immature counselors do. But a great counselor, a wonderful counselor, will sit in the space. They'll sit in the awkwardness. Their ability to sit still is what distinguishes a great counselor from a good one. So personalize this. Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever felt like God didn't care? Or maybe that God wasn't listening? Friends, if Jesus is a wonderful counselor, as he is described here by Isaiah, by Isaiah then you and I should not misinterpret his silence as him abandoning us. In fact, I would propose that God's silence is just the opposite. You know, in the book, Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby writes this. He says, sometimes as you adjust your life to God, he requires that you wait on him. Learning to wait on God is one of the hardest but most important aspects of the Christian life. God seeks a love relationship with you and waiting develops your absolute dependence upon him. You may think of waiting, Blackaby writes, as passive. But waiting on the Lord is anything but inactive. Unquote. The prophet Isaiah once preached in chapter 40, verse 31, that those who wait and trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You see, waiting, brothers and sisters, it's a two-way relationship. And as our wonderful counselor, we need to know that Jesus sees us. And we need to know that he promises to guide us. And sometimes he chooses to do that by giving us space and silence. Is that a message some of you need to hear today? Friends, don't let the devil somehow convince you that you're alone or that God doesn't care because he does. That's who he is. He is our wonderful counselor. So let's say another prayer. Okay, hands open, heart open mind open. Just say, God, please help me to practice patience. 
God, please help me to trust you when there's silence. See, Jesus, I want to trust you more. You are my wonderful counselor. I want to trust you more. So please help me today and in the days to come to practice patience. Good. Gift number three. A third gift that God promises to give us through a personal relationship with his son Jesus is the gift of power. Power is the gift God offers all of us. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and he will be called, in Hebrew, which was the language that Isaiah wrote and penned these words, it's translated El Gabor, which is the title of divinity. As I mentioned earlier in our meditation, any times uh, at the beginning of our service, any time the word El is used, it's making a reference to God, Emmanuel, God is with us. And so the nation of Israel, as you know, was looking for this, 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 this leader this, who could lead them into sort of victory over their hostile world. And Isaiah predicted 700 years before the arrival of Jesus that that victor king was coming. You know, uh, Isaiah incidentally lived during the time of King Ahaz and Queen Jezebel. You ever heard Jezebel, that name Jezebel? They were a wicked king. Then they were, she was a wicked queen. And then and, and they, they ushered to sort of this, this dark, evil period in, in the life of the people during the days of Isaiah. And people were looking for hope. They were looking for, for somebody who could lead them, uh, you know, and to fulfill God's promises. And, and, and Isaiah said, he's coming. He's coming. Now, little did they know that they would be 700 years before God's promise would come to fruition. Which explains why I think the angel announced to the shepherds here in Luke chapter 2, I bring you good news of great joy. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born in Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem. Today, the, the city of David, your wait for a king is over. You know, it shouldn't surprise us when Jesus arrived on the scene that he brought with him God's authoritative divine power because that's what God had promised he would bring through the prophet Isaiah. You know, later in life, and know, most of you know this, as you read the Bible, Jesus would, would, would demonstrate this authoritative mighty power as he stepped into people's lives. And I propose, brothers and sisters, that still to this day, for those of us who call ourselves Christians, for those of us who have gone to the manger, if you will, and invited Jesus to be in our life, I propose that much like the shepherds, Jesus will be not only our Savior Messiah, but with the Savior Messiah relationship as followers of Christ, as followers of Jesus, his power is something that you and I can experience as well. Power to break demonic chains. Power to heal broken relationships. Power to deliver people, deliver people from addiction. Anybody ever been delivered by the power of Jesus? I mean, addiction from addiction by the power of Jesus? Jesus gives us power to birth new beginnings. One of the things I love about the, the begin, being on the, on the sort of the doorstep of a new year like we are 2024 is it represents a new beginning, a chance to, to make some new goals, some new targets, some new places to visit, some new, whether it be eateries or new habits, new habits. the habit. I like habit hamburgers, <laughs> yeah. right? It gives us an opportunity to do new things, to live. Friends, are you living your life with Jesus' power? If not, could you use an infusion? Again, I ask you, what battles are you facing in your life today? What hopes and dreams do you have for your life in this coming year? You know, as you look towards 2024, what do you think God has in store for you? Are you going to tackle your life goals in your own strength or are you going to lean on Jesus' power? Mighty power is yours if you want it. All you have to do is ask him for it. So let's ask him for it. Hands open. Heart open. Mind open. In your heart, just pray this. Jesus, in my life, I want more of you. 
Breathing in, and I want less of me, right? Jesus, please clean out my sin. Please renew me anew, right? Tell him, I want your mighty power, Jesus. I need your mighty power, Jesus. More of you, less of me. This is my prayer. Good. Let's land the plane. For unto us a child is born, we're told. Unto us a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And gifts four and five really are intimately inter interrelated. You see, because when a person pursues Jesus, as we see the shepherds doing here in Luke chapter 2, our lives, your life will be changed. And many of you have experienced that. You know, quick, quick, let's take a quick poll. Show of hands, how many of you ever, have ever had a bad day? Okay. You, know, you ever had a day when you're sort of off balance a little bit? You know, a couple weeks ago, I was, first time in my life I, where I was dealing with vertigo. Anybody ever struggle with vertigo? It's the weirdest thing. I was up, I, I, I was preaching and I was thinking, I hope, I, did you notice it? I, I hope I don't tip over. <laughs> you know, woo, woo. Jesus is never off balance. Jesus is always in the zone. You know, in the sports world, and maybe you've heard an announcer say this before, but sometimes you'll hear a person talk about an athlete being in the zone or playing unconscious. You ever heard that phrase? And when an athlete is in the zone, when an athlete is plain unconscious, really what that means is that everything is going right for them. What do we do when we hear a siren? The Lord. When a person's in the zone, it means when you throw them the ball, they catch it. They don't drop it. They don't bobble it. They make the play. You know, for those of us who play basketball, sometimes once in a while we'll get in the zone. And that means every time you shoot the ball, it just hits but nothing but the bottom of the net. It means it goes in and just flushes it. You never miss. For those of shooters, you know, when it, so much of athletics is you want to peak at a certain level, which means you want to develop. So when it comes time to the competition, like the Olympics, for example, you're at, you're at your, you're in the zone. So when you shoot at the target, you hit it over, bullseye, over and over and over and over again. You're in the zone. You're unconscious. And the Hebrew translation here for everlasting God is hero God. Everlasting Father is hero God. It means that everything Jesus touches turns to gold. He is in the zone. He never has a bad day. He never struggles with vertigo. He will never leave you in the lurch, brothers and sisters. When he, Jesus, as the everlasting father, tells us that he is steadfast and he is dependable. And when it comes to our eternal security and eternal home in heaven, when we put our faith in Jesus, our salvation is secure. You know, one of the verses that I was resonating on this past week is from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that says, by, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of works. It's by God's grace that's going to get you into heaven. Not by living the perfect life, which means if my works can't get me into, my, into heaven, that means my sin can't keep me from heaven either if I go to Jesus with them. You know, a lot of times the devil likes to beat us up and he likes to remind us of where we've fallen or the mistakes that we've made. And we know we've gone to God and we've asked him for forgiveness and yet still those, those, we, we feel guilty or we feel dirty or we feel like, ah, I wish I wouldn't have done that or you, you fill in the blank. I, I know I can't be the only one. And Jesus is just, so, just saying, when you come to me as the everlasting father, your sin can't keep you from heaven any more so than your righteousness can get you into heaven. I'm your everlasting father. And so when you come to me, your salvation is secure. And maybe that's a message some of you need to hear today. Jesus, in him, 
our eternal home is secure. He's the everlasting father, which translates us into experiencing gift number five, which is peace. Jesus is the gift, we're told here, of peace. Which I suggest is probably why these shepherds ran to find baby Jesus. It explains why after they experienced Jesus and they experienced his, his touch, even as a, an infant, that they went back, we're told, to their flocks, glorifying and praising God because Jesus, meeting Jesus, was already beginning to transform their life, which is what Jesus will do for you and me. All we have to do is ask him. You know, what's interesting about this phrase the Prince of Peace, is there is this, uh, you ever heard of the, the, the phrase prosperity gospel? It's this phrase that means that when you, when you serve God, that he's going to bless you, maybe financially, or bless you with, with, with other things. That's where this prosperity gospel comes from. When we give our heart to Jesus, and I would be remiss not to suggest that that that's what the Bible is suggesting here. That when we put our faith in Jesus, Jesus promises us that he will bless us materially. And some of you have experienced that in your own life. In fact, all of us really have. If we're living in Orange County, California, come on. We're richer than most people anywhere in this world. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Prosperity. He is the giver of all blessing. That's what the angel said in Luke chapter 14, 2, 2 verse 14. Let me just read it again. We find it. Chapter 2 verse 14. The angel said, glory to God in highest in heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When we put our heart on, on Jesus and our faith in Jesus, he's going to bless us. He's going to pour out his favor on us. And thus a personal relationship with Jesus not only has eternal ramifications for our soul, but there's some room here, I think, for God to bless our lives with a material prosperity. Don't push that away. Don't say, well, that's not, that, that, God doesn't want me to be rich. You sure? You sure about that? Listen, the Christmas story is one that still has relevance and traction for your life and my life today. God says here, I want to bless you as the prince of peace, as the prince of prosperity, as the giver of blessing. I want to bless you with prosperity. That's who he is. That's what he does. And he wants to transform our life. But you've got to recognize that prosperity and financial prosperity is not going to bring happiness into your life. It's just stuff. You know, you, you, when we, nobody ever sees a U-Haul trailer behind a, a coach, right? A hearse. You can't take it with you. But we can use these resources not only to enjoy them, but to, to, to bless others, to be God's hands and feet, which is what we talk about and do and practice. But it all begins with our heart. Have you given your heart and soul to Jesus? You know, he, when you do, you know, we have the promise of eternal salvation, but he doesn't want us to stop and wait for heaven. He wants us to continue to live, which is why he says, I'm the mighty power to you. I'm the Prince of Peace today and every day. So in closing, let's pray one more for her, okay? Hands open. Heart open. <clears throat> just say this. Just pray this in your heart right now. Say, Jesus, I want you and I invite you to transform my life. Say, Jesus, I want to experience more of you today and in the days to come. Say, Jesus, please forgive my sins and lead in my life. And in your generosity, please help me to experience what the angels promised, your peace and your favor, your gift of goodness and love and joy and hope and peace. 
Say, this is my Christmas prayer in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah promised 700 years ago, which Jesus fulfilled and continues to fulfill every single day, five Christmas gifts. Security, guidance, power, right? Eternal home and peace. And as God's Isaiah, this mouthpiece today, a modern day Isaiah, if you will, I'm claiming those gifts for my life. Will you claim them for yours? I pray that you will. And in the, Jesus, in the name of God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I bless you with these five gifts. Receive them. Use them. Lean into them and share them. Amen and amen and amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Why don't we stand together as we sing this last song? have a good Christmas. We'll see you guys next week.